Contrast Security enables organizations to secure their applications from development to production. By embedding security sensors within software, Contrast automatically and continuously detects vulnerabilities in both custom and open source code while developers write code, providing them with context-specific how-to-fix guidance for easy and fast remediation. At the same time, by identifying only true vulnerabilities that pose risk and eliminating those that do not, Contrast empowers developers and security teams to prioritize and focus on only those vulnerabilities that matter. Learn how Contrast can help you secure your applications from development through production at securityweekly.com forward slash contrast. Whether you need to manage bots, protect cloud applications at runtime, stop form jacking attacks, or secure your web applications and APIs, only Imperva offers a unified solution to protect from edge to application and data in one tool. Imperva helps you achieve more, save money, and become more efficient with fewer security vendors needed. Start a free trial today to easily protect your apps and website with Imperva. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Imperva. We discuss application security a lot on this show, and we know that the implications for code security have become even greater as cloud adoption accelerates software development. Shift Left bridges the gap between security teams and developers to find and fix vulnerabilities accurately from the source. Shift Left Core is an innovation in code security with industry-leading accuracy and speed. It combines next-generation static code analysis, intelligent software composition analysis, secrets detection, security insights, and contextual developer security education in one one easy to use platform. Learn more and create your free, yes, free account at securityweekly.com forward slash shift left. Looking to improve your web application security? Probably is reinventing web application security. Probably focuses on the vulnerabilities that matter, eliminates false positives with evidence-based scanning and provides a simple point-and-shoot solution that is easy to use. Probably's thorough coverage ensures accurate identification of vulnerabilities in any modern web application or API. Improve your web application security processes by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Probably and start your free trial today. And so the conversation turned back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, with John Kinsella. InfoSec World 2021 is proud to announce its keynote lineup for this year's in-person event. Hear from Robert Herjavec, plus heads of security at the NFL, TikTok, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Stanford University, and more. Plus, Security Weekly listeners save 20% off on World Pass and Main Conference registration. Visit securityweekly.com slash ISW2021 to register now. Security Weekly Unlocked will be held in person this December 5th through 7th at the Hilton Lake Buena Vista. We are excited to announce our speakers, which is a massive list that I'm going to read off right now in one single breath of... Leslie Carhart, John Strand, Alyssa Miller, Dave Kennedy, O'Shea Bowens, Marina Savada, Patrick Coble, Chris Ang, Eric Escobar, Nick Leghorn, Michael Schlatt, Kevin Johnson, Justin Kohler, Jay Beal, Trenton Ivey, and Ryan Cobb. Visit securityweekly.com slash unlocked to register and check out more of our exciting lineup. And Mr. John Kinsella, that brings us to news of the week. If there are, I always try to look for themes in, in the news to sort of tie things more uh, fundamentally together, the stories we go on. Uh, this week, I discovered that I was a sucker for articles with, that are at scale, but we'll get to those in, in a second. So um, I guess free advice for anyone who's writing a blog or an article, just put at scale in the title and I'll, I'll probably... <laughs> grab it. But before we get into those, um, there's some vulnerabilities that we got to go through, I think. And these were some interesting ones. So we're going to pick on Azure a bit just because this was a uh, old, very super simple, ouch, 90s types of, oh my God, uh, type of vulnerability um, that basically there is to set things up. And when you're set, running up a, a Linux VM instance within Azure, Azure throws in a, a, a embeds an open management infra, infrastructure, as I can speak, agent, basically so that this Linux VM can talk to a couple other Azure services like logging, automatic updates, things like that. So it has a pretty good purpose. The problem is that some researchers discovered if you just strip off the authorization header from those HTTP requests, uh, bienvenue. You are now uh, <laughs> welcome to get into root access, UID0, GID0, which is an unfortunate surprise because this is very clearly the cloud service provider's failure in that uh, shared responsibility for security. So I, I know you're going to be exercising restraint, John, as always, but um, 
What's your opinion on this topic? I don't really have one. Uh, it it, it <laughs> so it showed up last week at the same time after um, uh, the uh, ACI issue, which sort of blew my head off, to be honest. Um, and when I realized actually right before this call, I've got um, I've got a shell box over there, which I it's you know it's, there's nothing on it. I'm not doing anything with it. I need to go and look and see if it's been popped. Um, so. It, yeah, so I mean, to actually to, to put some sort of thought around it, right? Every time any customer out there listening, if I say I'm going to put a um, an agent on your box, the first question I'm going to get is, um, is it listening, right? And like, no, those of us back from Qualys days know the agent doesn't listen; it talk, talks outward. Um, right. So you've got an agent which is listening. Okay, well, how have you secured that? Oh, we've authenticated it. Okay, sounds good. How do we test that? So there, there's sort of standard questions. Um, Amazon has gone through this with the uh, metadata server, although they didn't have a, anything quite like this going on. Um, I, I don't know. It's been a really interesting year for, for the folks at Azure. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of hug ops, but I think those guys are sort of due for one. So, um, yeah. At, yeah. You know, this is. I guess the takeaway for our listeners is, as I just walked through that 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 use case, if you're going to put a daemon on a box, the absolute last thing you want to do is have is have is to service inbound requests. Um, that's something you do nowadays, like for web servers and databases and things that have been really well re- really well written. Um, y- you want to be outbound with a type of daemon or agent or anything like that you have, unless there's a very very good reason for it to be listening to inbound connections. Um, I mean, I guess the. The architecture I would, I would expect someone to go after with something like this is a message queue, which then the daemon goes and connects out to Microsoft's message queue or Azure's, um, checks for any new jobs, and then goes back to sleep. Not not this thing, whatever. I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked at it closely, but that that's sort of, I'm just looking at it from a high point of view, and, and that's how it should be dealt with. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great message because you're speaking to the idea of what are just good designs that we should adopt or designs that have failed in the past that are sort of known anti-patterns, and why don't we avoid them? Which comes to also a good segue, I think, for talking about design to this uh, forced entry vulnerability and the write-up from Citizen Lab. So uh, th- there are two important, honestly, aspects of this story. One is the the social aspect, the, the person aspect of what is the impact to humans who are using social media, who are using messaging apps, who are impacted by surveillance, by being targeted by authoritarian governments or other, any organization, or even just general abuse. It's the idea of this scaling, this sliding scale of what does trust and safety look like within an app? What is the threat model? It was a good callback from to, to the conversation we're having with Jeff. And how does that threat model apply to different populations and how is it being addressed? So that's a little bit of just kind of my, my my high level um, reasoning for pulling up this this article and just saying, suggesting you read through it, have these types of discussions about what is relevant to the apps you're building. But the, also the technical aspect of it is, we saw at the beginning of this year, I think in episode 138, we were talking about Blastor, which was a good design improvement and architecture change that Apple had taken with iMessage, basically acknowledging Parsing is hard. Parsing is rife with problems. And every time we parse, whether it's a GIF file or a GIF file, one of them is going to cause problems eventually. And so what they tried to do with the blast door was isolate those parsers, making it so that exploits are more difficult or exploits aren't as consequential. But unfortunately, Blastor does have some holes, or at least a hole, that this forced entry vulnerability um, found and caused a lot of havoc. And especially if you have any iOS device, uh, you were probably updating it just this past week. It's uh, sorry, I was on mute. It's it, it was a busy week for my network last week. I think actually the the watch is the one that went off first. It, like the watch had an update. I'm like, didn't you just update a few days ago? Yeah, they have another one. Um, and then, yeah, I won't even count the number of Apple devices in this house. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's. It, I'm glad they patched it so quickly. As um, I got lucky last second, I got asked if I want to be on Paul Security Weekly last week, so we were talking about it on there too. Um, the the way I was thinking is, I got the impression that they patched this on Monday. Uh, really after the show, after ASW. But I think they did it so that when those guys got on stage on Tuesday for their, their, the broadcast, that they wouldn't have something like this out there they could say they responded to it. So if that's the case, kudos for responding that quickly. Um, 
we talked some stuff, some, I can't remember if we covered it here, but we talked there a little bit last week about, you know, some of the grumblings around um, the security community and how Apple's treating them. So for folks who want to hear a little listen about that, that's a good reason to go listen to last week's Paul's Security Weekly. Um, the, the, the write-up's interesting here. I like the little PDF they've got in there um, showing actually what's going on. Um, you know, this this is well... Well, NSO, if this is NSO, is they're doing pretty advanced things, but still the PDF itself, it looks pretty similar at first glance, right? And then you realize, oh, they've, they've got some fun going on here. Um, yeah, it's it's. It, I, I think it's probably really great that Blastor exists. I think a lot of these things we're seeing, um, it'd be nice to have this type of sandboxing around everything. And then we come back to uh, um, Joanna was it Rujana's, uh, what's the OS she has? Cubes OS, where everything is Cubes, sandboxed. Yeah. Um, and I will probably have to head towards that for phones and most of our things, I think, at some point. But it's just how do we get there in a efficient manner? Yeah. And I think part of this, too, is um, great call for Paul Security Weekly, especially a lot more of the background, just <laughs> as you said, security researcher community and Apple and that relationship. But I did want to highlight here, more generally speaking, that, yes, there is another Vuln. Vulns are inevitable, and that's not to be nihilistic about it. And mm. but it, and it's not to say also that the, the move towards Blastdoor was a mistake or, oh, look, it doesn't fix everything. It's more of, Let's take a let's take a reasoned look at what the threat models were that it was addressing because Blastdoor actually in this article and a couple other that I posted in the show notes was addressing actually yet another NSO group exploit. So <laughs> this is a march forward in good things, but I think as you're pointing out, we're going to need more of that assist like a cube OS that doesn't even have a concept of a root, just these relationships between trust areas. I can't remember the term; it's not quite trust zones, uh, but the same thing of isolated parsers, sandboxing, and to beat the drum again, uh, possibly also getting off of C or memory unsafe languages into different languages for these types of critical attack surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, you speak of uh, nihilism. Um, and that I think that's it's, it's an interesting point here because the way I was talking about it again last week in the other show, um, we're going to yeah, we're always going to have vulnerabilities. We're always going to have issues like this as as we as a as a you know, really, a, I don't want to say human race. As as technologists are always coming out with new tech and, and new sort of features on these things we carry with us now every day and, and sleep with and live with and eat with. Um, as you know, I think the example I used last week, we were talking about a um, 4K. Oh yeah, saying with you know 4K video now with Dolby Atmos. Okay, is Dolby Atmos or whatever their their Dolby 4K is? Is there any vulnerabilities in that? Like every time we want to do something newer and greater and cooler, there's always a chance that we're going to come back to some of these things in here. But that doesn't mean just like, you know, go and, and cry in a corner. It's like, how can we actually, how can we um, take that into account and try to make sure we catch these things and handle them correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, which great message. And I'm going to come at, speaking back to my themes. Uh, the, the theme that we started off talking about Azure was also when and Travis, uh, CI flaw, about our service provider, providers. Because as you were correctly pointing out, um, we can improve our designs, secure our things, but we also may unfortunately be undermined about our with, by our supply chain or our vendors. And here is just a, a quick reference to uh, secure environment variables being exposed in pull requests for public repos. So a, a kind of an interesting uh, confluence of events there, but very much that surprise to your users, which you don't want to surprise users mm -hmm. in, in, in the security environment, whether you're uh, with an OMI management interface with a listening agent, or in this case, um, a commonly used design pattern to pop those secrets, application secrets, or sensitive variables into, or sensitive values into environment variables, where they're supposed to stay local to a trusted build, trusted server, and in this case, they were clearly leaking out and bad things could happen. So don't have too much more to say on that. Um, it wasn't too much of an in-depth um, in depth article other than um, look out for your supply chain, I suppose. It's, it's it, this, <laughs> this one sort of comes back to me a little bit like the Azure stuff from last week, the ACI stuff. And like, once we go and tell people, hey, you should be doing this, like you should be using a CI, <laughs> you should be doing these type of things, then for that system to have an issue, um, and Travis has been around for, uh, do you have an idea? What, late 90s, I think, if not early 2000? It is um, ancient, yeah. So 
and not a, I mean, it's it's got a pretty good track record. And this is just one. I'm not trying to say, oh my God, drop Travis, which some people are saying. Um, it it's yeah. It, it, these things were happen. It comes down to how do you respond to it. And you know, it's unfortunately when you're something that that's public, and a lot of people will treat Travis without security because they have the point of view of this is my open source project. We're using Travis for free. Um, you know, there's nothing super secret about our code, so we'll just leave it there so anyone can publicly see it. Now you see a reason maybe you wanted to put a little more security on there. Um, but yeah, it's it just, I, I think that's the, the one takeaway is like, how do you respond to this? How do you make sure this doesn't bite you in the future? If, if you are, um, if you're giving your keys to someone, can you limit the scope of your keys? Can you limit how you use them? If you're taking those keys from somebody, can you? How do you make sure those are protected? Um, I think that's really the two sort of takeaways on this. Is like, how do you, from a pure appsec point of view, how do you deal with this? Not so much operational. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that gives us a pretty good segue into our commentary at scale on two different articles here. And one is about finding code owners and, fi and managing code ownership, which speak quite directly, I think, to what you were just saying, if the sense of if, if we do have a problem, who's responsible to go and fix or change how the secrets are, are handled? Or, hey, they've been exposed in Travis CI, we need to rotate them. Who's responsible? And finding out who is uh, quite what is one of those difficult challenges, just as Jeff was saying about as app asset inventory. Uh, it's great to understand how many apps you have, but then you also figure out who owns them. And this from uh, Twilio was just describing one approach that they used. Um, it, it, good example, I think some of my, my gut reaction to it is that this is a great way to take care of the code provenance aspect by saying we're going to have a, a company-wide standard and we're going to have a way to automatically keep an eye on things so if it decays over time but there's there's still some challenges there with legacy code unknown services as well as just making sure how accurate is this code provenance this code ownership uh, over time as people leave orgs, things like that. So it's a great step forward, so definitely a hard a hard um, problem to solve. And while I'm, I, I, I feel like I have kind of a neutral reaction to it, I also don't have any great uh, suggestions about how to do this even better. I think what's missing on this is um, really a description of what the problem is. What's the pain point they're trying to solve? And I, I think I sort of get it. Um, and for those who are in a larger org with like, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 repos, people coming and going and all that type of thing. I think that's sort of, that's, that to me is a pain point, right? Is because um, the, the first thought you have is like, well, if you're using Git, just look at your Git log and like go and contact those people, right? And okay, well, what if those people move on? Or what if this code has been updated in a few years or those type of things? So I think that's when, um, I think that's the pain point they're trying to attack. Um, but it, 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 it wasn't really clear to me from my read of of that. Um, and, you know, feel free to tell me that I'm, I'm completely wrong. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, the YAML is nice, but it doesn't really tell me what they're doing with it. They've got some sort of linter on it, Gordon, but it looks like Gordon's just linting the YAML. Is it actually doing anything with it? So, um, I, I don't know. It fell a little short to me. Maybe I'm not fully missing, maybe I'm misunderstanding what they're doing. I, I see the problem, but I guess like, why wouldn't you just have like an, you have an author's file, that's sort of standard for open source. So why wouldn't you do that internally? Or I don't know, what, what am I missing? Yeah, I, I think I, I don't think you're missing too much. What, what one of the couple things that you might be missing is the um, that that aspect of who's responsible for it, like the vulnerability scanning. So we have mm -hmm. someone like Jeff or Contrast come in. They give us a good prioritized list of vulnerabilities. So who's responsible for all these repos to fix it, especially for dependencies in especially stale applications that haven't been updated in a long time. And I think the other thing is sort of that ownership of who's responsible, who understands the code. If you're also trying to have um, uh, m making new services and pushing things forward in this you know interconnected microservices world, if you're trying to say, ah, we're moving all of our services to this other uh, you know, mutual authentication, or we're, we're moving microservices to use a different model of identification, or the way they're they're doing authorization with each other. If you have unowned code or code that is kind of orphaned and, and is really hard to pull along with that type of forward progress, uh, that's it, it's speaking to that idea of you're accruing a whole lot of tech debt, and so. Yeah. 
this case might not be entirely convincing, but to me, is that's the part where it resonates of just trying to figure out who owns code so you can fix phones and keep it from becoming completely tech debt. Fair enough. And um, so yeah, so so that that that's the kind of of, of resonating silence that means John Kinsella has been convinced. Um, <laughs> let's see what other things we can convince him of uh, by securing Netflix Studios at scale. So this is a really long article, um, and some things that 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 stood out to me that I liked about it were the the principle behind how they approached the. Um, uh, basically saying, rather than just telling everyone, we built this tool, now go use it, uh, the, the the product security team said, we have, we're, we're going to pick a high risk authentication of services. We're going to build a way that p- makes it, that has a value and a desire or at least show some benefits for people to onboard to it. So it's sort of saying, rather than build a requirement, build a checklist that you must do this before you deploy, we're building a tool that is actually encouraged or helps users come on. So it it definitely takes a lot of engineering work as much as it takes some communication and collaboration work. And I think that comes through in this article. Um, But I thought that was a pretty good way of showing basically modern application development. And essentially, you Netflix is quite known for, I think they're the ones who coining, you know, the, the idea of paved roads or at least quite extolling the virtues of doing so. So a good read from that perspective. Yeah. And I think that's what um, surprised me about this. So it's, I, this has been sitting in my tab since last week. I, I scanned over it first day, but I haven't read it. I've been slammed. Um, and by the way, thanks for Mike for getting these articles in. I, usually, usually for our listeners, we sort of go some sort of half season, some, some version of half season getting stories. And I've been a little slammed last week. Um, so yeah, I, I think of of Netflix as the the paved road, and and you know um, they've done an awesome job there over the years, both with cloud security as well as AppSec. Um, and when I saw this, the surprise to me was like, why would why would Netflix security be getting in the way? They've got a pretty well oiled ship, <laughs> but I, I guess apparently not. Um, and yeah, the takeaway for me was, as you said, um, man, the conversation. Uh, and it's what I'm seeing in some orgs recently is while people will initially embrace that idea of that we talk about of um, let's let's go and actually have a conversation and and we're going to build exactly what the, the teams want. Frequently, what happens is that conversation happens initially. People get a bunch of ideas. They go with their idea what they think they are and try to implement them and then come back instead of really sort of continue that conversation. So I think that's the big takeaway for me here is like, you know, just keep, it's not a one-time thing. It's almost, you want to, you know, go in temporarily. Well, in the before times, I'd say go in temporarily, grab a cube beside one of the guys you're working with developer and actually make sure you're building what they want. Now, I guess it's like, what, get another zoom window or something or Slack or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's. I mean, if you look at like Wally itself, it's nothing really rocket sh- rocket science. I don't think, but it's the rocket science here is the that collaboration. So yeah, it is. And I think the only other thing I'll add too is that um, hey, you millennial Gen X folks out there in engineering and appsec, uh, start building in those and start building and naming some of these types of applications because clearly between Zool, Wally, and uh, Twilio was Gordon as a Commissioner Gordon Batman reference. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of <laughs> the the generation of who's building these tools. So I'm looking forward to some good Gen X naming schemes for uh, great solutions in the future. Uh, speaking of great solutions, um, possibly not a great solution. So I did. I, maybe maybe I, I set that up a bit too strongly. There's another <laughs> article on a theme f- uh, from Android about making permissions auto reset. And this was I kind of cared less about that. This was specific to Android or that Android was rolling this back from you know Android 11 all the way to Android 6 when it was named after some dessert or whatever. I can't remember the naming scheme. Uh. But um, it, more of the principle behind this, the idea of uh, introducing decay, of introducing failing closed, or saying that decisions don't persist permanently over time. It's a great way to say maybe permissions should be granted temporarily. Um, and just how do we build from a 
product security team and application security team? How do we build that into our own permission grants for just-in-time admin? Speaking of um, Azure, that's one of its approaches to um, handling you know sensitive access to its systems. And there's a lot of ways that principle could be brought into, in this case, Android and engaging the users. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that as something that I don't think is necessarily an explicit part of the OWASP Top 10 even. Maybe it falls under that insecure design. Uh, but this is would be one of those great things Things that is a, a nice way to create a secure design. So I wanted to highlight it for that reason. Yeah, I thought it's a great idea um, for as you know, pretty much ninety nine percent of the reasons you just said, maybe even one hundred. But um, <laughs> it's I'll have you convinced soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think what it's coming down to for me is the what's the UX going to be like on this? Um, is because I, I could see if if this isn't really executed smoothly. You're going to have people in about six months that are like hitting a whole bunch of having to go back and set their permissions, which they didn't understand in the first place. Um, so is is it going to become a more annoying software, like you need to reset your password with these 14 different types of characters? Or um, it, see what I'm saying? Like, how smooth is this? Oh, yeah. Like, I really like the idea of it. Um, but I think that's the part that will be sort of remains to be seen how it actually gets executed, or how it is being executed. Yes, if we reinvent the um, that little pop-up that says this website might be insecure, please cl click OK to continue, <laughs> and um, that's probably the wrong direction to go. So, um, excellent call out for the UX here. Um, speaking of speaking of other impacts you could have on the future of application security, John, about not only the impact of UX on these types of things, but you could have an impact on IoT device criteria. So here's another article that unfortunately is a bit kind of in the interim, so not too much meat yet on updates on what NIST is doing with IoT. Um, but they did have a workshop li uh, last week. Um, the the videos from it aren't posted quite yet, but I'll keep an eye out for them. Call out anything that might be really interesting to see. But I did link the uh, PDF uh, that NIST is looking at for these device criteria, and there is, they are looking for comments and feedback all the way through uh, middle of October. So here is a call out to our listeners. Uh, send your feedback to John, who will put it into his own friendly manners, <laughs> and uh, send it, that commentary to IoT, and we will make uh, devices much better. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what, Mike, what's, the, what, what's the address they can send it to, John? Mike, Mike, what are you doing? No, don't send our listeners to, to go on watch a bunch of NIST workshop videos. That's a, that's that's modern day be, torture it's right there. Be just as exciting as we are. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this looks interesting. It, I, I think they're. Uh, it looks like they grabbed the baton from what they did in the UK, uh, what six ten months ago, and they're going to try and do something like that similar here. And um, better late than never. Uh, it looks like they got the right folks in the room, so it'll be sort of fun to see what comes out of it. But yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll take all that feedback. Um, Discord, please, and uh, I'll forward it directly to your, your personal phone number, Mike. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Touche. Um, speaking of se speaking of setting myself up for a pitfall there and taking on more IoT work than I expected, there is one final article that I did grab about eight pitfalls that undermine security program success. Now, this is on CISO Online, um, which I think you have to at least give them an email to, to to get in and read the article. So I do apologize for all of you having to make up emails to um, send so you could get in and read this article. Uh, but, it, you know, I highlighted it for two reasons. One, this is something that's in front of CISOs. What are they thinking about or ostensibly thinking about and reading maybe is a fair, fair point to say. But the very first point is, is what really stood out to me, that one of the pitfalls is talking about just pure security risk rather than business risk. And this, I think, is a, a fair callback to our conversation we just had with uh, Jeff on the previous segment when we're talking about here are all of the vulns you have in your, in your application versus here are the vulns that are actually exploitable or that carry the most risk. And rather than fix every single thing that a tool could find, fix this shorter prioritized list, um, as well as diving into what does business logic really mean. And I think those are pretty important uh, topics to bring into threat modeling, bring into that AppSec discussion. So just for that one, that very one sentence, even though they didn't put at scale in the title, it was that <laughs> sentence that that, that that got my attention here. So I don't know what, if there's anything else that you want to build the case for or against in, in any of these pitfalls, Mr. Kinsella. What caught my eye on a few of these pitfalls is they sound like... Um, things I expect to hear 
junior staff doing, right? So mm-hmm. like falling for the new stuff, right? We have all seen, well, any of us with a few years experience have seen that, that new guy who's like, oh my God, new tool. Um, and new guy, keep looking at those new tools. We like you doing that, but like we're not going to stop everything for it. Uh, but looking for the new tool, um, uh, what else? Another one in here was like focusing on right now versus like keeping the eye down the road. Yeah. Um, you know, they mentioned keeping security within the security department. Talk about our last segment or our last um, yeah. story of, of collaboration. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's I, I think I'm with you. The first one was the sort of the, the interesting one and that that um, I think we can bang that drum pretty loudly, please, is is realize we're not just building a product for ourselves, right? We're building a product that's going to be hopefully make money and, and grow the business and allow us to hire more coworkers and um, get us bonuses for our holidays and stuff like that. And obviously, hopefully also make people more secure. So that's really, it's, it's to focus on, on what are we doing outside of just, um, you know, adding a few more lines of code or bringing another tool. What's the reason behind it? Excellent, excellent advice, or excellent, excellent question as well. What is the reason behind it? And um, I think that's a, a, a good open question that, will, that will, there's, there's our homework for the listeners because one of the other pitfalls is overlooking your security workers. And we are not overlooking you, dear listeners. Come join us on Discord, ask questions, and um, share your advice on what's the reason for doing this, perhaps, is your, or how you approach the, the AppSec and developer uh, collaboration. And uh, that is my hopefully not too clumsy way of wrapping up yet another fun segment. I want to say thank you once again to John for joining us this week. Thanks, everyone, who's been listening. And uh, we will see you next week on Application Security Weekly.